In the second part of our conversation with Judith Butler, philosopher, professor at the University of California at Berkeley, we talk about gender and identity in the world created by COVID. The mandate to shelter in place has, in many regions of the world, locked women and children into households where uh, violence um, is inflicted upon them, um, um, usually, not exclusively, by the men in the home. And there is no place to go, right? You are mandated to be inside. It's harder to get access to social services. It's harder to move across the town or the country to be with a with another set of friends or relatives who could possibly uh, offer a better shelter. Um, I also think um, that uh, trans and queer youth, non-gender conforming youth, and this is not just in the U.S., but in many parts of the world, um, uh, are, are, are particularly vulnerable to discrimination and exclusion. Many of them have been uh, forced from their homes, have been disowned by their parents. They don't have the same support. So for mobile populations, and here I would also obviously include refugees and those who are um, seeking to flee from, uh, from violence in territories, uh, the shelter in place has been a disaster or along the along the border as well. Uh, I'm particularly alarmed um, that Poland, Romania, um, uh, and other countries um, have heightened gender restrictions, have decided that the term gender shouldn't be used in schools, or have refused to recognize um, trans people as legally trans. They've refused to offer and maintain legal recognition and support um, insisting that they are really another gender, not the gender that they truly are. Um, as healthcare has become monopolized by the state and, and more fully regulated by the state, that has um, allowed some uh, uh, conservatives and reactionaries, homophobes, to transphobic um, uh, uh, officials to gain power and to to really uh, press through uh, legislation or executive decisions that deprive um, trans, trans people of their rights, uh, gay and lesbian people of their civil rights, and also women of their reproductive rights. We had talked last time about hope, but social movements very often come out of anger at the type of injustice that you were talking about. How do you link these two? I do think social movements form in relationship to injustices and out of a, a sense of indignation and rage and a moral and political sense of um, having, having suffered uh, harm or violence uh, or exclusion um, that is uh, absolutely unjustifiable. Right? Many people are enraged not only at the violence that the police have um, inflicted um, against um, uh, a wide range of minorities, and here I would say black and brown communities, but if we think intersectionally, it would be trans communities and queer kids and, and women who call because they are in a situation of domestic battery and are looking for some kind of help only to find that the police come and hassle them more, uh, sometimes doing further violence. Um, so looking for justice and uh, uh, demanding justice comes out of many different affective uh, um, sources, uh, rage, indignation, um, but, a, but a kind of mor moral sense that something is not right, that this is unjustifiable and that this is a destruction that does not need to happen. I think hope comes when people join and other people are with you. Oh, I'm not one. I don't have to do this heroically. I am with others who feel the same way, who confirm my sense of reality, who also think this is unjust. And you start to belong to a wider community. Some members you know and some you'll never know. Some members you're, you speak their language, other members you'll never speak their language. But you're still kind of solidaristic because you don't think the environment should be destroyed or you don't think police should be beating up people of color or women or trans people or you know, I mean, whatever it is, there's a no, there's a, I, there's a, this reality should not be taking place. And the hope, I think, emerges precisely as the links of solidarity expand 
And as you realize that your sense of what the world should look like, both morally and politically, is shared by others. They do not think we should be living in a world in which these things are happening, which means that they do think we should be living in a world in which they're not happening. Well, how to create that world? And that world-creating capacity is there in social movements to the degree that, so, that those links of solidarity start to build another vision of sociality, another vision of social relations, and also put forth ideals that have been perhaps considered unrealistic or impractical, like justice, like the, the end to police violence, like the end to incarceration as we know it. Uh, ideas that have been uh, dismissed as unrealistic are suddenly on the table being openly debated.